All right, British lawmakers have just approved a bill to legalize assisted dying. After hours of debate today, the House of Commons voted 334 and 275 against supporting the bill. I want to pay a huge and heartfelt tribute to those families and to every single person who has contacted me about this issue, and in many cases, shared their own very personal stories of loss and death. I know from my own personal experience of grief <coughs> that telling your story over and over again takes energy, courage and strength. And I'm incredibly grateful to you all. It is your voices and your stories which have inspired me. <clears throat> over the years, high-profile figures have given emotional first-hand testimony on the subject. Under the legislation, terminally Ill, terminally Ill people would be able to take a substance to end their lives. The bill must still pass the House of Lords and parliamentary committees. For more, let's bring in Gareth Owen. He's a professor of psychological medicine, ethics and law at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to start by reading a quote from Esther Ranson and for our international audience and uh, who don't necessarily know, who might not know who she is. She's a, obviously a British uh, former talk show host, BBC journalist. and. Um, she was recently diagnosed with lung cancer, and what she said was, what is happening at the moment is compelling people to have really agonizing deaths. That memory of someone in agony becomes a tragic memory that overwhelms other happy memories for the family left behind. The law at the moment, before today, obviously, is a mess and it is cruel. Um, obviously, this bill was quite controversial, but for those of us who are fortunate enough to be healthy, it is really difficult to understand what people who are terminally ill go through at the very, very end stages of their lives. Just give us your take, Professor. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I mean, the end of life, the last six months of life, is, uh, in my experience of working clinically in palliative care um, settings, actually remarkably similar to the rest of life. It's actually quite similar to how we live our lives. Um, people with uh, terminal illnesses are of, have terminal illnesses of very different types, um, and they're often very well looked after in um, medical social care provisions in hospices and so forth. But there has been a lot of anxiety, I think, within um, the population at large about end of life and um, a concern about wanting to be able to exert or um, have control over those final periods to be able to put exert control and choice over death. So the, the question of choice and autonomy is very much at the forefront of this um, discussion and debate. And in the research group I'm involved with at King's College London, the Complex Life and Death Decisions Group, we had uh, some public opinion polling research which showed that about two thirds of the public um, do want legislation uh, of the type which um, Kim Leadbeater in the yeah. Westminster Parliament introduced today. Um, so we know that there is a good amount of popular interest or public opinion interest in this, in this legislation. There is concern about how it can be implemented, and even in people who support it, um, there's concern about the issue of pressure and coercion. So what we found in our research is that amongst those who support it, the majority actually would re potentially revise their support of it if cases involving coercion and pressure were to come to the fore. Yeah. Um... You know, just touch on, on that point. There, there were a lot of people who were concerned about coercion and, and pressure, and, and that it would be expanded not to just include people who have a terminal illness, but um, those people who might be, for example, disabled, vulnerable, elderly people, other people beyond those who are terminally ill might feel pressured, might feel coerced uh, to possibly end their lives before they were ready. I mean, that was some of the fear and concern. What, what do you say to that? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, those concerns were expressed very well in the debate today, five hours of, of really very high quality debate in the Westminster Parliament. They were also expressed in the, in the public opinion polling that we did. So when people are thinking about vulnerability, they're thinking about people with mental health problems, they're thinking about people um, who've got, let's say, cognitive impairments, they're thinking about the elderly, and so on. Um, now, 
coercion or pressure is a very subtle thing. It can be sometimes extremely difficult to detect. And it's not only external coercion, um, i.e., you know, obvious cases of, of, of putting of, of um, other put people putting pressure on somebody. It can sometimes have an internal source. So you internalize a sense of yourself as not worth it or um, having uh, a duty uh, to, in fact, end your life um, for the benefit of others. Those internal forms of coercion are incredibly difficult to be certain about um, and to assess. So one of the concerns that I think will have to be continued to be debated here is what does the change in the law um, mean? What sort of effect does that have culturally and societally on um, what the sorts of questions that people ask themselves? Um, and those were points that were very very well made in, in, the, um, in the Westminster debate today. Diane Abbott uh, made some very striking um, points about that, I thought, today. Yeah, I mean, you, you bring up a, a really good point that coercion is, is very subtle. It's not something that is always just sort of said outright. It can be sort of implied. It can be intimated. And it's also about people who might just feel that they're a burden on loved ones, on family members. There are those who also worry that palli palliative care will get worse um, under this bill. I mean, what do you what do you make of that? Your thoughts on that? Well, I think a very heartening thing of the debate today was that across um, all of the differences that were being expressed, there was um, a shared view that palliative care uh, needs to be um, developed in the United Kingdom. It needs, to be, it needs to be strengthened. A lot of it occurs within the hospice movement, which, which really are charitable organisations. So they depend on the sort of goodwill, really, of public giving. Um, and so there was a lot of discussion about how palliative care needs to be improved um, if we're to go forward with, uh, with this legislation. And I thought that was positive. All right, Professor Gareth Owen, life was there. Thank you so much.